In this video, we'll introduce another alternative to the regular autoencoder and the denosing autoencoder, known as the contractive autoencoder. So again, here we're trying to fix this problem with uh, regular autoencoders with overcomplete hidden layers, uh, uh, which can actually do a perfect job by just copying in, copying individual units in the input vector. So in the denoising autoencoder, the way we fix that is by adding noise before uh, feeding an input uh, to the autoencoder. We instead uh, uh, feed it a noisy version of the original input, but we'd ask it to recover the original input. And uh, so remove the noise, denoise from the original input. Now in the contractive autoencoder, instead what we'll do is that we're actually going to uh, try to explicitly avoid uh, this uninteresting uh, solution by essentially explicitly, uh, by adding an explicit term that penalizes that solution. Um, the way we're going to do that is based on this motivation. So the types of features we like to extract are really features that are that reflect only the types of variations that we observe in our training set and from the training distribution in general. Uh, and otherwise, we actually like hidden units that are invariant to other types of variations, variations that uh, are not meaningful for that type of data. Uh, so if we have a solution which corresponds to copying each of the inputs individually, then this is really reflecting any possible variation. So any type of vari variation here will be perfectly reflected in the hidden layer. Now here, that's something we'll try to avoid. We try to uh, encourage the neural network to only have hidden units that reflect variations that are specific to our training set and other, that are otherwise uh, as much as possible invariant to any other types of variation. So the way we'll do this is design this new loss function where in addition to the reconstruction error from the autoencoder such as this one for binary observations, the uh, cross entropy one, we'll add this term which is uh, going to be weighted by some hyperparameter lambda and uh, which multiplies the Jacobian of the uh, encoder uh, for which we take the square of its uh, Frobenius norm. So the new term we add is a weighted uh, squared Frobenius norm of the Jacobian of the encoder, which is this thing here. So uh, we remember that the Jacobian uh, of uh, a function, so in this case the function is the encoder function, is going to be the matrix of all partial derivatives of all elements of that vector with respect to all elements of um, the uh, variable with respect to which we're uh, computing the Jacobian and in this case it's the input vector x. And so if we want the square of the Frobenius norm then it means that uh, we would be uh, this here would correspond to the sum over all elements of the at the output of that function in the hidden layer uh, nested with the sum of over all inputs so that's the variable to which I'm computing the Jacobian of the squared of the partial derivative of that element in the encoder uh, with respect to that element k in the input vector so what do we have here? we have first a term which says I want the encoder to keep all the good information that's necessary for me to have a good reconstruction of the original input. And then I have another term which says, well, try actually to, I want an encoder that throws away all information. So why is that? That's because a way to minimizing the square of the partial derivative is to have a partial derivative of zero. If the partial derivative is zero, it means that if I change the value of x, it actually won't change the value of the hidden unit. So in other words, it doesn't contain information about this particular uh, uh, value of uh, this particular element in the input. And so if I wanted this to be 0 for all hidden units, it means I, have, I would have a uh, uh, hidden vector which does not vary uh, if I change the input x. Now, uh, there's a caveat to this. It's, it doesn't vary, uh, so the partial derivative is really what happens 
around a point, so in this case at a particular value of x uh, of x t. So for at that training example, what we're saying is that we don't want the hidden units to change if I add a little bit of, say I add a little bit of random noise to it. I want the hidden layer to stay the same. Now I can't have a hidden layer which is invariant to what the input value is and that also reconstruct well. I can't have an encoder that keeps information and throws information away at the same time. But if I combine both, then what I'll get is that an encoder which will try to have hidden units that only keep the quote-unquote good information about the input, the sufficient information for reconstructing the input while being as much as possible invariant with respect to the input for any other directions, any other types of information in the input layer that, that's not useful at all. So to gain a little bit of a, an intuition for how this uh, can work, we'll do a little bit uh, cartoon illustration of, uh, of this. So again, imagine that I'm uh, actually in 2D. Well, actually, I'll be in the very high dim uh, dimensions, but I project back the, uh, I'll assume I'm projecting back the uh, inputs into a, a two-dimensional uh, plane here. And uh, imagine I have data which lies on this one-dimensional manifold like this. So actually imagine that my data is this training example here, this 2, and any rotation of that 2. So this would be a rotation uh, counterclockwise and a rotation clockwise. And so any of these x's is just a rotation of that. Now, um, our objective, what kind of hidden units would it uh, prefer? Well, if we had a hidden unit which was such that its value changed in that direction, so if we went from that example to that example to that example, uh, imagine a hidden unit which would take larger and larger value. Well, that hidden unit is useful for reconstruction, for instance. It uh, would allow us to distinguish between that input, that input, and that input. So I feed it this, then there. Presumably there'd be a way of from the value of that hidden unit to say I should reconstruct something like this and not something like that or something like that. Uh, however, this hidden unit will be um, uh, will have a Jacobian which is uh, or partial derivatives which is not zero because it does vary. It doesn't have a partial derivative of, of zero if it varies its value by changing the value of the input. However, if uh, the lambda that weights the Jacobian is not too big, then um, if this hidden unit is really useful for reconstruction, then the, the loss in terms of, uh, so the fact we're doing worse in terms of the Jacobian should be compensated by the fact that we're doing much better in terms of reconstruction. So that would be a hidden unit uh, which would be useful. However, that hidden unit would not be useful because for one thing, if its value changes like this, and, uh, well, you know, a variation in this direction, this local variation, here it means that this hidden unit and this hidden unit and this hidden unit would essentially have the same value, like, a, you know, a value that if, uh, if I project all values of that hidden unit on this line, they would all essentially have this value here. So this hidden unit would not help me to uh, distinguish between that input, that input, and that input. However, also this hidden unit is... Uh, has partial derivatives that are not zero because it does value its uh, output, its value, if I change the value of the input. And so we've uh, made the Jacobian term in the loss worse, its increase, but also this hidden unit does not help us actually uh, getting better reconstruction error. So a hidden unit that behaves like this is uh, would actually be discouraged when we're optimizing it and the optimization would tend to not find hidden units like this and instead try to discover these hidden units. And so again, we have uh, we should have hidden units that uh, learn something about the uh, lower dimensional manifold uh, behind our data. So learns about the structure, the meaningful structure that characterizes our uh, training distribution. Uh, so I'm not being very specific in my details. I'm sort of trying to give intuition here and I encourage you to look at the paper for getting perhaps a more uh, mathematically, mathematically grounded intuition for how this is, but that's essentially what contractive autoencoders uh, do. Now, uh, in practice, we find that denoising autoencoders or contractive autoencoder both perform well. They outperform regular autoencoder in terms of the quality of the features they extract. 
Uh, they have different advantages, disadvantages. The advantage of uh, the denosing autoencoder uh, is that, well, one could argue it's simpler to implement. Really, if you have autoencoder co code, it merely corresponds to adding one or two lines to your code, the lines that would add the noise before feeding it to the, uh, before computing the encoder function. Um, does not require computing uh, the, Jacobian, uh, the Jacobian of the hidden layer. Uh, so the Jacobian is this, is this number of hidden units by number of inputs matrix. So this has uh, uh, some implications in terms of how slow the uh, uh, how slow the method could be, and and that's the loss function. So now we have to take the if we want to do gradient descent of that objective, we have to do uh, compute the gradients of the parameters with respect to the Jacobian matrix, which is itself a matrix of derivatives. So. That's, the math can easily, uh, quickly become hairy, though there are some libraries that facilitate this but with automatic differentiation. The advantage of contractive uh, autoencoder is that we actually have a gradient which is deterministic. There's no sampling involved when we're training uh, a contractive autoencoder. So we can more easily and directly use second-order optimizers like conjugate gradient or LBFGS and so on. Um, there could be ways of sort of uh, playing with the denoising autoencoder and, and still trying to um, uh, use conjugate gradient and LBFGS. Uh, but just generally speaking, it might be more stable if we do this in the context of contractive autoencoder because the gradient is deterministic. So uh, then it means that we don't need any sampling for getting the gradient. And so we're getting an exact gradient for what we're optimizing. So we can expect perhaps a, a more stable performance. Um, so really, it's just a matter of choice which one you prefer and you want to implement. Um, and again, so I refer anyone who wants to learn more about contractive autoencoders to look at this paper here by uh, these uh, researchers at the University of Montreal. And that's about it for contractive autoencoders.